The world looks different from behind the handlebars of a rad power bike. A trip to the grocery store can turn into an impromptu visit to the pool. Commuting becomes a chance to skip traffic and grab an iced coffee. And spring break is always just a bike ride away. There's never been a better time to find your fun. Check out Rad's limited time spring deals today at radpowerbikes.com. Welcome to another episode of the Brown and Black Podcast. My name is Jack Rico. And I'm Mike Sargent. And every week we take a look at race and pop culture through a brown and black lens. Well, Mike, I'm pretty excited about this episode because... It has a lot to do with the Afro-Latino experience in America. And we're going to be talking to, as a special guest, with Rome Flynn, who's Afro-Cuban, but also has Irish blood. He's the future, man, of multicultural America, mixed race, much like most of us are. And one of the interesting things is he's promoting a show that's right now on Amazon called With Love Season 2, where he plays Santiago Zayas. And his competition for a Latina girl is this Asian guy. So as an Afro-Cuban in the show, he has to compete for the love of a Latina with an Asian jock rock star and it's an interesting way of looking at like the new potential of what American programming can look like through the Afro-Latino perspective. You know what I'm saying? I know exactly what you're saying. And it's not just a look at what programming can look like. It's a look at our future. That is the future. Mixed races, people getting, I mean, at the end of the day, she's attracted to him he's mixed race she's attracted to the asian guy he's asian she's just attracted to who they are and that's right. that's really the future so i had a chance to go on wpix 11 news on new york living with marisol castro and alex lee who had invited me to do a segment on the summer previews and what i had thought were the most anticipated summer movies of 2023 and guess what my first one was Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. All right, let's get to it. What's All the right. first first blockbuster? Well, uh, I got five films mm. for you uh, for this summer. It's the most anticipated ones that I feel are going to hit hard, are going to make some sort of, you know, major noise this summer. And the okay. first one is Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Can't wait. And this is a film, uh, a sequel from the 2018 right. hit film. Now, remember, Spider-Man is not really an animated film. Right. Mm -hmm. So when I think Spider-Man fans first heard it, I was like, wait a minute, an animated film? This is not for mm -hmm. kids. Mm -hmm. And then you go see it, and it's one of the best movie experiences with Spider-Man that you've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And it's one of, also one of the first times that they go into the multiverse. This is right before the Everywhere, uh -huh. Everywhere, all, all at once. Uh -huh. That's right. Uh, <laughs> That's right. And so now this is the second one, and it has an incredible cast. Haley Steinfeld, Oscar Isaac, John Mulaney. Oh, my God. So many more. And Miles Morales, who uh, is played by Shamik Moore, um, he's an Afro-Latino. Uh, thank you. Miles Morales. This is something that everybody's been wanting, uh, especially Latinos and Blacks, for mm -hmm. a long time. Now we get him a second time. Will we ever have a live-action version? <gasps> but the great thing about this film is that it is the largest crew ever assembled for an animated film. Could you imagine? Okay. 1,000 crew members of animators did this film. So you're going to be watching history. Wow. When that many people go on and make a movie, it has to be good. Well, Jack, you did a preview. I actually saw the film. Wait, wait a minute. So, well, let me what tell did you, you think it, of it? This is a milestone, and it's a milestone in, in a lot of ways. On, on the technical level, it is the longest American-made animated film ever at two hours and 20 minutes long. But here's the thing. It's directed by Joaquim Dos Santos, Portuguese-American, and Kemp Powers, African-American. So right there, the directors are brown and black. The main character... Miles Morales, Afro-Latino, 
Jack, besides the fact that this is a fantastic story and the animation is mind-blowing and unforgettable and that it has so many elements that are what make comic books great, what makes this storytelling, the reason the genre has lasted past the point where there should be more fatigue and there isn't, it, it still shows you that there's magic left in making superhero movies. But Jack, this character is an Afro-Latino. He speaks to his mom, played by the great Luna Lauren Velez. And when they speak in Spanish, there are no subtitles. Wow. Well, this happened with West Side in Story as animated. well. With Steven Spielberg, where they allowed the Spanish to be told without any subtitles, immersing the viewer even more into that culture. Because let's be honest, Mike, when you go to a foreign country traveling, are there subtitles for you? Are you talking to the waiter or to the hotel clerk? Is there subtitles for you? No, if they don't know English, you're kind of screwed. You're immersed into that culture at that moment. And I think that's part of the movie theater experience. It's not only part of the experience, but it's part of what it is to be in America. If you're in America, in the real America, I mean, like, n not just the cities, but America is a place of multiculturalism, especially in a place like New York, where we live. You know, you can go down the street and not only are there all kinds of cuisines, there's all kinds of people with all kinds of backgrounds, all kinds of languages being spoken around you. And Spanish, for this country to not have embraced Spanish, it is part of the DNA of America. Yes. And to see it on screen and not have to be subtitled, say, well, either, yeah, you get it or you don't. It's there. And the acting, the animation. But to see ahead, I'm sorry. black skin speaking in Spanish and English mm -hmm. at the same time, you know, that's beautiful, brother. That is so beautiful. And I think that the future of Marvel and DC films could be actually, let me say it like this. Spider-Man across the Spider-Verse could be the future of Marvel and DC films, immersing the public with a new look to the eye of diversity. If this movie does what we expect it to do at the box office, blow past the billion dollars again, then Mike, there's your template for the future of Hollywood. Listen, I, it's being touted as the best Spider-Man ever portrayed on screen. And that's not just because of the performance and the story, but it's just that it is all encompassing. It's the Spider-Verse, it's the multiverse, but it's also the, the universe of, of humans that are here living in this country right now. And with that Afro-Latino experience in mind, Mike, here's our interview with Rome Flynn, where we talk not only about the season two premiere of With Love and what Santiago Saiz's role is in this show. But we also talk about the WGA strike and what could that mean for the career path, not only him, but for the whole industry of creators that are bonded in this art form of film and television. And Mike, I couldn't let the interview end until I asked him this one last question. There's a specific Latino baseball player that Every Latino has always wanted to see on the big screen. We've been asking for it for maybe over 40 years. And we asked Rome Flynn if he would want to play that role. Will, why don't you just take a seat? Why does it feel like my brother's about to break up with me? That's very astute of you because I actually am. Wait, are you kicking me out? Never leave again. You have a tendency to lose yourself in a relationship. Once a cute boy comes along, you neglect the things you care about. Happy birthday to me. I didn't catch your name. Santiago. First of all, Roman, so great to meet you, man. I had a chance to see the first season of With Love, and yeah. you were one of the topic of conversations with me and Gloria Calderon Kellett. And before we talk about your role and what's going on with your career, 
-hmm. I wanted to ask you, first of all, what you thought is the big significance of With Love, of a show like this, where to me, it's a show that I'm used to seeing white people star in. Yeah. It's a show that feels not of our gente. It feels American, like there was an American framework. But instead of seeing these white characters, we're seeing these characters of color within these situations. Um, mm -hmm. What to you, Rome, is the significance, the cultural significance of this show? Why is it unique? And why should people tune into it? Well, I mean, that's, that's an amazing question, honestly. I think through my journey of being an artist and doing this business, it's always a purpose of mine to be a part of projects that I feel are not even just culturally representative of where we are as a society, but also like things that I hold close to me. You know what I mean? And this show is right up my alley for that. When I think about with love, it's like these, I guess, unlikely group of characters in the sense of society in our world. And with love, it's, it's, it, it feels very cohesive, but you're right. We haven't really seen a show like this, mm -hmm. um, but I do think that's because the masses aren't really, as far as the general public, aren't trying to tell those stories. And so for Gloria, I think it was very important for her to cast everyone around, Emira, myself, and everyone else to really embody these characters to represent the traditions and life that people actually live. And when, you, when, you, when you're thinking about like how big Amazon is, right? And think about how right. you can just reach so many people that way. It's, I mean, it's huge. At this point, it's still an anomaly, though. You know what I mean? It's still one of its first, and it's 2023, and we're having that conversation now. I know. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's, it's even strange. That, I won't say strange, but it's interesting that we would even have this as a topic. You know what I mean? For us to say, like, we don't see this, and, and we don't. But it's an uphill battle to, to really fight for that real estate in this industry. They, they only go off what's being watched, views, and the money and statistics behind it. That's yeah. If that's the only thing they really try to pay attention to. But if you don't have anything to really base it off of, and I think really this show is at the forefront of discovering what it looks like to have this many characters, this many genders, this many backgrounds, and really have the story be told in a seamless way. It's, it's, it's a marvel. It's really a unique situation. And I think that's accredited to obviously Gloria, but she really empowers everybody to have the opportunity to make decisions. And I think that's unique as an actor. Like you, it's, I won't say it's rare, but depending on who you are, it's rare to have that opportunity for your showrunner to say, for instance, hey, let's talk about this scene. Let's figure out what makes sense. And I think the, the, the presentness of what we do in these scenes really allows people to feel like they're watching something unique. You know what I mean? Because we, we have a lot of scenes that we do, we rewrite them day of. You know what I mean? It's as an actor. <laughs> I love that because it's I'm trying to get as far removed from anything rehearsed as I, as I can, mm -hmm. as far removed as from myself as I can be. And so there is a level of rehearse that goes along with learning the lines and learning where we are and understanding what's happening. But once you all have that figured out, it's like, well, what are we doing here? What are we trying to get across to people? What are we trying to have people watch in their homes? And for me, I take pride in, in knowing that projects that I've been able to be a part of have all stood in this space of, of purpose. And, and that really is what drives me. I think early in my career, I didn't really understand. I didn't really have that thought in my mind. There was a character on Young and the Restless, Kristoff, and he passed away some years ago. And he was like a prominent Black actor on that particular show, and they didn't have many. And I, I remember I was in my first year of doing Bold and the Beautiful, and I had never been a, on a series. I mean, I, I was so green. And I was about a year and a half, a year in, and he pulled me aside and he's like, man, I watched your work. work. And uh, I mean, I looked up to his work because I'm like, man, he's been doing this for so long. And yeah, it's surprised he even knew who I was because Bowling Beautiful and Young and the Restless, they, they both filmed in the same space right across from each other at CBS. And he told me, he said, it's really important what, what, you, what you're doing there. You probably don't see that now, but you know, I can count on my hand how many people of color have been been on these shows, have been on your show. And 
he really opened my eyes to a perspective that I really mm. was neglecting. I didn't even know that. I was just kind of going through it in the sense of like, wow, I'm working, I'm living my dreams. But then it became even more important to me. And it just made me so much better as an artist, as an actor, to be honest in every yeah. aspect of these opportunities I've been able to get. And so I think that all kind of translates to with love and, and what it represents. And I'm just saying, like, this show could could be made by somebody else. Right. But I really feel like the attention to detail and the the education people are getting from this show when they don't even know they're being educated, I think it's it's a marvel. I think people don't want to feel like they're learning something. They don't want to feel like they're being taught or being told what to do. And this show has has the ability to teach you without knowing that you're being taught. <laughs> And you leave their understanding a little more about gender conformity and, gen- and, and non-binary and these sort of situations where you really obviously wouldn't unless you're seeking for that information. And they're being told in a light that is not from a perspective of trauma per se. I mean, all of these characters are coming from that because that's our nature. That's that's kind of the culture that we come from is from trauma. You know what I mean? And a lot of stories have, have spawned from trauma, like relationship-wise, family-wise, all these things. But there's always light at the end of the tunnel in these conversations and these scenes that we have. We may end up at a place where there's a misunderstanding, but by the end of it, we find some resolve and it's earned and it feels purposeful and it doesn't feel like we're trying to force you to think way, the way we think. Or we, we're just, the, the point of it for me as an actor is to have people almost look, be like in a looking glass, like peeking in my window, like from outside and just just kind of looking at me be who I am. And and that is the, if I dilute the form down to that for me, it's like I want people to look into my home as if they're watching who I am and this is a real person, this is who they are and these are these people. And that takes a lot of effort and a lot of fight, you know what I mean? And that's why, that was a huge reason why I wanted to do this show. And obviously Gloria is, is she's incredible, man. She's, she's really a, a pioneer. She's just just beginning and just figuring it out. Along the way, she's been very transparent with everything. So as an actor, a lot of times we don't know what's going on behind the scenes. And so she, she, she brings us all into the fold and say, hey, this is what's happening. This is what we're doing. This is what we're trying to do. And so we really create this family environment where I feel like it translates on screen. But what's someone as charming as you doing alone on Valentine's Day? It just never felt magical. Love can be great, but it's definitely not magic. People will surprise you with nothing. Sometimes it feels like I'm not only dating you, but your entire family as well. Your family hides everything. God forbid anyone ever admits something's wrong. I can't build my life with someone that is so glass half empty. To getting out of our own way. You had talked about the honesty in your characters and how you would try to achieve that. Let's talk a little bit about Santiago Sayas. A lot of people in the press have called him the a modern Afro-Cuban American Mr. Darcy. <laughs> and he's well educated. He 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 prefers books over television. He, but he's a cynic and he doesn't believe in love. And in, in season two, we kind of see him kind of caving in. He caved in so towards the end. But I want to talk to you in specific about the issue of what Gloria had mentioned about the casting process of Santiago and yeah. and you. She had told me I had interviewed her for the highly relevant podcast last year. And when we talked about you and, and Santiago and, and you, she had told me that she had cast when she was thinking of doing Santiago, the original role, because I had congratulated her. It's like, wow, I can't believe you have Afro-Latino actors that are inhabited by Afro-Latino characters. Like, what are the odds? She goes, right. that's impossible to do, Jack. Yeah. And initially, I had Black actors say thank you, but no. Mm-hmm. Because I wanted to give the chance for an Afro-Latino character to play that. Right. When I heard that, dude... I mean, you said no to money. (laughs) I'm going talk about ethics in this industry and in the acting industry where everybody is campaigning for a role. Yeah. What did you think about that? Because I also know that Gloria told me that producers aren't allowed to ask for the actor's ethnicity. Right. So 
how did you handle this situation of the conversation with Gloria without her asking if you're Afro Latino? And what did you think about black actors giving space for Afro Latino actors in this industry? I think that it's, it's at a certain point, it's all of our jobs to try to make space, especially people of color, like to try to make space for these, for these demographics to play specific roles that fit them. I mean, we just saw something come out about Moana. There was a live action thing and the, and the actress decided to not do it because she felt there were actresses who, who fit the bill a, a little bit more than she did. I, I, obviously, that doesn't happen. It's, very, it's a rarity. Yeah. Uh, when we're in a business where, for instance, if there's a cast of six or seven people, maybe one is, is a different ethnicity. It doesn't even have to be Black other than Caucasian. So we're, we're all fighting for that one spot to try to get there. And so I think that for me, Gloria and I never spoke about me being Afro-Cuban, but obviously I read the script and I knew how important I felt for me it would, it would be to play this character. And I think what, what was more important was the, the fact that you mentioned the characteristics of who Santiago is. I think on paper was just really hard to kind of fathom a guy that would be interesting to watch that would be that way. I mean, we're talking about a guy who doesn't like people, who doesn't like parties, like who, who really wants to watch that. You know what I mean? And that's kind of what we had t- talked about, mm-hmm. Gloria. And even, even with, the, with the network, even with, the, with Amazon, they were just really unsure like, about Santiago. And, and Gloria had told me that during the casting process, this was like the hardest role to cast because they really didn't, they, they felt they couldn't find a person that was going to be able to play these certain levels. And I think underlying that was also, yeah, finding someone who could be Afro-Cuban to play this character is just... I mean, a shot in the dark. Yeah, you know? <laughs> that's what she said. Yeah, this demographic, this age range, there's so many different things. I was even surprised they found someone who was also Afro Cuban to play my dad. I know. You know Arroyo is it's like, it's just a very t- specific attention to detail when you're talking about creating a show. Is the reason it becomes successful? You know what I mean? And being patient and not kind of taking shortcuts. Because I know, again, you know, when Gloria, when she did uh, One Day at a Time. So uh, what's this history project you're working on? And then maybe later you can show me how to turn into a bat. Your mom's kind of mean. I'm obsessed with her. I swear to God, if that Vieja calls me Maria one more time. Mrs. Doyle has Alzheimer's. Oh, no, I'm so sorry. Hey, I'm messing with you. She's just racist. And that was a huge success after a while. You know what I mean? There was a bumps in the road with that show, but it became what it was and it was beloved. Mm-hmm. Once this was announced that she was doing this, that there were a lot of people who wanted to have the opportunity to work with Gloria in any capacity, obviously myself. And when it came about, I was just kind of like, wow, I really feel like I'm perfect for this. But a lot of times it doesn't matter who's perfect. You know what I mean? A lot of it, it could be so many different variables as to why things don't work out in this industry. The truth is, the better I guess subjectively actors and always get the part, most of the time it's that's not the case. It's more so about other things. And so I knew I, I just knew that it was a there was a chemistry, and I had a chemistry read with Emma Rod over Zoom, and uh, I knew right away, like working with Gloria, that that this was something. This is a place I wanted to be. Like I had just come off being on How to Get Away with Murder. And working with Viola Davis and the just the pressures of being on a on a network show that is very popular. And I after that point, I said, turn down a bunch of stuff. I was turning on stuff that I just was like, I was in a place where I want if as far as series regular work, I wanted to be somewhere I could be happy when I could tell stories that I wanted to be a part of. And what so were I, you getting, if you don't mind me asking, that you said I, no to? Yeah, C W some CW stuff. Why some, wasn't that a route for you? It it was a thing where it's like I just couldn't go backwards. I had just, again, worked opposite of Viola Davis. I really just, if it, if the situation wasn't completely like, yeah, this is an obvious choice, then it, it just wasn't. And and so I didn't have those, again, for me, even coming off that show, I didn't have crazy opportunities where I was, have the opportunity to be a leading man. You know what I mean? It was still kind of second, third, or fiddle. And I was like, I don't want to, especially on network shows where the contracts are seven seven seasons. You know what I mean? I was like, Hey, I just got to work with one of the best actors ever. And for me, I can't, 
neglect the growth I felt I had over that time period. And just to take something just because I, I wanted to take something, you know what I mean? And so this thing came about with Gloria and I read it. And I, at first when I read it, I was like, man, I didn't really get the, I understood the concept of it, but I said, I just understand how it could work, especially at that time. <laughs> you know, like, right. You want to do well, you would have had these sort of, so much representation, so much, but the, but the writing was just so good. Yeah. And I knew it was going to go because I'm like, it was Gloria. She just did an amazing show. And so it's going to get opportunity to get some life. And I read the script and, and then initially I, I didn't say I, I turned it down, but what happened was I was filming already. I was trying to compartmentalize what I was doing. Um, I was doing Raising Dion at the time, I think. And I got the script for this and I read it. And I was like, there's, there's no way like that's, you know what I mean? Like, that's going to, that's not going to work. I don't know. And I just kind of like brushed it a little bit and they came back and was like, really want to take a look at it. And I'm like, okay, let me take a look. And I read it. And I was like, damn, I almost fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> I almost like did I almost wasn't you know, sometimes you don't pay attention and you're like, especially for me, I get caught up in what I'm doing. I get very obsessive about my craft. So it's, it's the only thing that matters at that moment for me. Right. And and that's how I honor it. You know what I mean? And so I had to really remove myself from that and go, wait a minute, let me look at the script and let me see what's going on here. And I was like, oh yeah, definitely. You know? So yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's been a journey being a part of this show, but mainly it's, it's an amazing show, but the visibility has been something that's been hard to get people to come around to. Because there's so much content out there and and the fragmentation of just the viewership habits it's yeah. it, it, it's hard to kind of break through the way th we grew up seeing other people break through yeah. and even if you have the goods it's about timing right and that leads me to the next thing timing has created disruption with the wga strike happening right now and I wanted to ask you about, there's the DGA strike that's ending in June 30th. You're part of the SAG after union. Where do you lie? Because this now affects you, Rome. Absolutely. You're looking at your career. You're looking at your path. You're looking at the decisions that have been made for years. There's a blueprint, a framework for you. You got a team that has been guiding you, supporting you. You've had great work that has elevated you. How do you approach something like this as as a, as an actor peeking into his his stardom? Yeah, this is one of the more actually I, I would say one of the most important times in in this industry where there's so many things that are working in, in the favor of the artist, but certain things we have to fight for. And just like anything in in, the, in this country and even in the world, you do that by protesting. You do that by standing on what ground you have and i respect that that's the only thing only change of, has only ever come from that but it's going to be irreversible wherever we are now when these strikes happen and if they do it looks like they they will we're going to be forever changed this industry is going to be forever different mm. and hopefully people have more stake in in what's available out there for the work that they're giving you know what i mean that's why I, i'm behind on wga you know what i mean i'm, I'm behind the, the decision to go on strike this is bigger than me you know what I mean? Although it is definitely something I'm like, well, shit. You guys have a lot on the stake as well. Like the actors, from what I'm understanding, Roman, you can correct me if I'm wrong. But according to the information out there, the actors are going to be fighting and seeking increases in compensation, residuals, and protections against AI. And I've been talking about this with a lot of people. I'm not sure if you've had a chance to see Ari Fogelman's The Congress from 2013, mm -hmm. which is about how actors become digitized in Hollywood. And so if you can explain to me how AI can disrupt the actor's career. And then I wanted to ask you about, there's a lot of complaining that's been happening recently about these self auditions. Yeah. And there's like an issue going on that I would like you to sort of expand upon because I'm not sure if everybody understands what's going on and why this is one of the things, one of the key things that actors are fighting with the studios. So if you can talk to me about the AI issue and yeah. if you have any concerns about it, moving in the future, 
licensing images, et cetera, et cetera. And then the self-audition process. What seems to be the problem there? Yeah, I mean, listen, the, the AI thing has been something I think that we've known is, is coming. But when it landed, it just landed hard. You know what I mean? And so, for instance, the, the video, uh, even the music, the music that's being recreated by these AI artists, sort of systems that are making music, have artists make music that they didn't make. You know what I mean? Yeah, like the Drake and the Weeknd like, song. <laughs> all that stuff. And it doesn't sound terrible. You know what I mean? And it's it's really, again, it's it's about individuality. And I think that the AI or the the, the trouble that is going to come with that is anytime you have new technology, you have these new things that are going to kind of reshape what we think an artist is, it's going to be threatening to people like me. It's going to be threatening to people who are who make music, who can who these companies will try to cut the middleman out. You know, or at, the, at some point they'll be able to lo- just license your likeness and your voice and just you won't even have to be there. You know what I mean? But the but the the interesting thing to me is that the magic is is in the mistakes. Right. The magic is in the shit we don't know. I mean, if they can kind of replicate what they think we would sound like saying certain things, for instance, they could just use our image and say, hey, we're going to have your your voice say this on AI. Gloria says to you, hey, season three with love. You know what, Rome? We don't need you anymore because we've got you for two seasons already acting. We're just going to mimic and duplicate your expressions and everything else. And she says, here's 50 G's for the licensing of that. Would you be cool with it? Absolutely not. I mean, obviously not. You know what I mean? And that's, that's the thing for me. It's not even about the money. You know what I mean? It's about the art. It's about the discovery. It's about, uh, it's a, for me, it's about the journey. And if I were able to just license, license myself to go do projects and not be there, there's not something I would want to do. I think as actors, we, we put ourselves in situations to feel things and to live in situations that we wouldn't be able to other, otherwise. And so that definitely robs you of that opportunity. You know what I mean? And so for me, I, I, I know that there is going to be a place where we have to figure out what's going on and, and put some sort of boundaries around AI, definitely. But it's coming. And it's definitely right now the conversation needs to be had because it's definitely threatening the artist. It's threatening the process. It ain't threatening the process for certain actors. There's, there's a small percentage of actors who I feel are above certain aspects of what's being talked about. But everybody else. You know what I mean? It's, and me included. You know what I mean? I'm still fighting for positions in this industry and we'll probably have to continue doing that just because of the, the nature and the history of people of color trying to do anything extraordinary. I, I don't have the luxury of fucking up. I don't have the luxury of getting things handed to me. I, I, I got to continue to work angles, continue to make strategic decisions and make the right ones. You can make one wrong one and then that, and that's it. You know what I mean? That's how Hollywood can be. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting to be living in the time now. I can't really do anything about it myself, but. And tell but, me about the self auditions. What's going on there? What are your peers upset about? I've been hearing horror stories about these self auditions where a lot of actors are asked to be not come in personally. Yeah. Not pay for the flight or the hotel so they can save on cost. So just do it on Zoom. And supposedly they're treated like absolute garbage. Mm-hmm. Like they're dismissed. They they have you been hearing about this issue going on? Uh, have you ever suffered anything like that at an audition? Why is this one of the key crucial things at stake with the SAG and the studios? Yeah, I think it's 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 really important. Now, the other part of it is. These auditions, a lot of times, they carry a lot of emotional weight. For instance, like if I get an audition for a project, it's going to be for a substantial role, which means it's going to be, I need to do a lot of work, prep work. You know what I mean? And sometimes these auditions are 10, 14 pages long. You know what I'm saying? Wow. And that's a lot of emotional real estate. For me, particularly because I'm doing roles that are, could be far removed from myself and you just kind of learn to deal with it. But the self-tape pr- aspect of it, for me, I think it's just about preference. To be fair, I, I'm not in a place where I used to be, where 
it was important for me to go into an office to meet somebody. Back then, that's how I got where I am. You know what I mean? I, I didn't do a self-tape. I went to my first project I ever booked, really. I went into office. I saw the director. I mean, you need someone to take a chance on you in order to really get far in this industry. And especially people of color, you need them to continue to take chances on you even throughout your career. So for me, it was like super important that I was in front of somebody because I, I needed them to see what was not on the page or what my resume lacked was just who I was and the essence of who I am. And you really can't get that in a, in a self-tape. You can't get the essence of a person in a self-tape. You can watch the performance. You can watch what they put together. But the, the finding that special thing <clears throat> about you that these people have to see you can't really translate through a self-tape. But for me, I'm not in a place where I need to go and meet somebody in person. But there's a lot of actors who, who really rely on that because they don't have the resume or the opportunity. So I can see where there definitely needs to be a medium. You know what I mean? I haven't been in an in-person audition in years. Congratulations, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> I mean, because of COVID, but also just because of, just because of the nature of things. I mean, listen, these people haven't even gone back to work. <laughs> they don't even have to. I mean, they get the sub tapes at home. They just watch them on their phone. You know what I mean? They watch them on a laptop. I mean, this is a completely different world. I mean, right. From 10 years ago when I first started, it's very different. Well, listen, we got two minutes left and I wanted to kind of get this last question out there. There's been a lot of talk from a lot of Latinos and sports fans that they've been wanting to see the Roberto Clemente story. And there's been talks about Rome Flynn playing Roberto Clemente, Afro-Latino, Afro-Cuban, even though he was Puerto Rican, Caribbean. Yeah. You'd be great at Roberto Clemente, Rome. Have Thanks. there been any conversations? Have there been any fan talks? Have there been any ideas of producing or writing a script? It'd be an amazing vehicle for you. And I just wanted to know if the thought had any, has anyone planted the seed? This seed's always being planted, man. <laughs> 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 I'm constantly trying to plant seeds and see what grows, man. But, but yeah, it'd be an honor. You know what I mean? It'd be an opportunity of a lifetime to play a role like that. It, Yeah. I mean, short answer, absolutely. I, I would love to have the opportunity. But again, those that story particularly would have to be written and told by a person who understands that. And there's not a lot of people in positions of power who have that bandwidth to be able to tell a story like that. But yeah, I mean, the fan cast, they, they fan casted me and everything, man. But that one, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, y'all booked me more than I'm booked. It's like, <laughs> but that particularly would be a dream. That'd be a dream come true. And um, I, I would nail it. Absolutely. We'll kill it. <laughs> Rome, congratulations. You can watch Santiago Zayas on season two of With Love on Amazon Prime Video. Rome, thank you so much for being on Brown and Black. Thank you, man. It's been a joy. And that's it for this episode of Brown and Black. If you would like to support this podcast, please subscribe and leave a review. Your help will allow us to be heard by many more people. You can follow our comments and opinions on at Brown Black Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and now we're on YouTube. We'll see you on the next episode of Brown and Black. <laughs>